குட் ஈவினிங் ஆஸ் ஃப்ரெண்ட்ஸ் வெல்கம் டு த ஹிண்டூ நியூஸ் அனலிசிஸ் பை சங்கர் ஏஎஸ் அகாடமி ஃபார் த டேட் ஃபோர்த் ஆஃப் செப்டம்பர் டுவெண்ட்டி டுவெண்ட்டி டூ பிஃபோர் கெட்டிங் இன் டு த நியூஸ் அனலிசிஸ் ஐ ஹேவ் அன் அனௌன்ஸ்மெண்ட் டு மேக் சி ப்ரீ ஸ்டாமிங் டெஸ்ட் சீரீஸ் பேட்ச் ஒன் இஸ் கோயிங் டு ஸ்டார்ட் அட் சங்கர் ஏஎஸ் அகாடமிஸ் அண்ணாநகர் பிரான்ச் த டெஸ்ட் சீரீஸ் கன்சிஸ்ட் ஆஃப் அ டோட்டல் ஆஃப் சிக்ஸ்டி சிக்ஸ் டெஸ்ட் இட் இன்க்ளூட்ஸ் போத் சிசாட் ஜிஎஸ் அண்ட் மார்க் டெஸ்ட் த பேட்ச் ஸ்டார்ட்ஸ் ஆன் டுவெல்த் செப்டம்பர் டுவெண்ட்டி டுவெண்ட்டி will be conducted in offline mode on the scheduled dates from 2 pm to 4 pm and it will be followed by a live discussion from 4:30 pm to 7:30 pm the students who missed the offline test can take the test online after 2 days for students who are taking the test online will be provided recorded discussion videos you can take the test online only until the start of shankar ai academy's mock test that will be held before prelims 2023 displayed here are the list of news articles we will be going through today now without wasting much time let us start our discussion take a look at this news article this news article talks about nano urea and the article reports that nano urea is fast paced for commercial application without being fully tested so in this context let us quickly go through nano urea and its applications in prelims perspective before that know that urea is a chemical nitrogen fertilizer it is white in color and it is a source of nitrogen we all know that nitrogen is an essential nutrient crucial for crop growth and development see after the development of settled agriculture what we do is we cultivate the same piece of land again and again so what happens here is since we cultivate the same piece of land again and again there is a loss of nutrient from the soil so we have to externally apply nutrients to maintain the fertility of the soil this is why we apply urea which is a good source of nitrogen to the soil know that urea is manufactured artificially by reacting natural gas atmospheric nitrogen and water together at high temperature and pressure to produce ammonia and carbon dioxide ammonia and carbon dioxide are then reacted at high temperature and pressure to produce molten liquid urea remember urea is most important nitrogenous fertilizer in the country because of its high nitrogen content it also has industrial applications such as production of plastics and as a nutritional supplement for cattle so because of its importance the central government even pays subsidy on urea to fertilizer manufacturers central government pays the subsidy on the basis of the cost of production at each plant and the units are required to sell the fertilizer at the government set maximum retail price but the issue here is that these highly subsidized urea are illegally diverted for non agricultural and industrial purposes by many private entities it is because of this reason IFFCO that is the Indian Farmers Fertilizer Cooperative introduced neem coated urea see neem coated urea is neem oil coated urea specifically developed only to be used as a agricultural fertilizer the coating of neem also slows down the nitrification of urea so it helps in increased absorption of nutrients in the soil as well as reduces ground water pollution along with the neem coated urea the iffco has recently introduced another form of urea fertilizer which is nothing but the nano urea now let's see about nano urea see nano urea is a nanotechnology based agri input which provides nitrogen to plants so it is nothing but urea but in nano size its size is as small as 20 to 50 nanometer and this size increases its availability to crop by more than 80% talking about its application see they are sprayed directly on the leaves they enter into the leaves through the stomata and other openings and once they enter into the plant leaf they get assimilated by the plant cells 
the nano urea has the property to easily distribute throughout the plant through the phloem of the plant see phloem is a duct in the plant that transfers food materials okay the plant utilizes the nitrogen and the extra unutilized nitrogen is stored in the plant vacuole see vacuole is also a cell organelle which helps in water management in a plant cell okay see this is how nano urea works the use of nano urea has specific advantages associated with it now let us see the advantages see as i already said due to its small size and more surface area to volume ratio the iffco nano urea particles are easily available for crops hence they increase crop yield secondly they increase farmers income see nano urea leads to increase in farmers income due to reduction in input cost better crop yield and better quality of crop produce thirdly nano urea also provides better food quality it is said that nutritional quality of the harvested produce after the use of nano urea is better in terms of protein and nutrient content then nano urea helps in the reduction of chemical fertilizer use see we already saw that the liquid nano urea is directly sprayed on the plant leaves see traditionally urea comes in white pellets which the farmers throw with their hand in the field what is the negative of this traditional method of urea application is this is highly wasteful because only some amount of urea is taken up by the plant and the rest are washed away by the water runoff but after the use of nano urea which is applied directly on the leaf the efficiency of urea use is highly increased see the iffco claims that one bottle that is 500 ml of nano urea can replace one traditional bag of conventional urea so nano urea rationalizes application of bulk nitrogenous fertilizer like urea and finally nano urea helps in minimizing the environmental footprint by reducing the loss of nutrient from the agricultural field in the form of leaching and gaseous emissions which used to cause environmental pollution like eutrophication and climate change see these are the advantages of the use of liquid nano urea so that's all regarding this discussion in this discussion first we saw what is urea and why we use it for agricultural purposes then we saw some points about neem coated urea after that we saw some points about nano urea and its advantages with this let us conclude this discussion and take up the next news article have a look at this faq article this article talks about bail and other provisions in the criminal procedure code 1973 with specific reference to women this is in talk because the supreme court recently granted bail to activist teesta settlewar she was arrested by the gujarat police in june 2022 on the charges of forgery and fabrication of evidence in the 2002 gujarat riots case let's not get deeper into this issue instead we will see about bail its types women specific provisions in crpc as discussed in the article the syllabus regarding this discussion is highlighted here for your reference you can go through it first let us see what is bail the word bail comes from the french word bailer which means to give or to deliver it generally means the procurement of release from prison of a person who is awaiting trial or on appeal it is done by the deposit of security to ensure his submission at the required time to a legal authority in simple terms it is just the temporary release of the accused person in a criminal case but this can be done only when the trial is pending and the court is yet to announce the judgment or it can be done when an appeal is pending before the court here the security deposit is known as a bail bond it may be cash or papers giving titles to property or bond of private person or a professional bondsman or a bonding company the surety or security is demanded because if the person who is getting bail doesn't surrender himself or herself at the appointed time then the security can be forfeited now in india criminal procedure code 1973 deals with bail in crpc the definition of bail is not given but it clearly defines bailable offenses and non bailable offenses now let's have an idea about these two first is bailable offenses as per section 2a it is an offense 
which is shown as bailable in the first schedule of CRPC or which is made bailable by any other law for the time being in force. This includes offences of less serious nature with punishments as three years or less imprisonment. In these types of offences, getting bail is considered as a right of the accused. Some examples of bailable offences are theft, bribery, cheating, etc. Then comes the non-bailable offences. As per section 2A, it is all those offences which are not termed bailable. So, they are offences of serious nature. That means the punishment is high. It could be even life imprisonment or a death sentence. In these type of offences, bail is not considered as a right. But the court has the discretion to grant bail after hearing the facts of the case. Some examples of the offences are rape, homicide, etc. With this information, let us see the type of bail one by one. First is bail in bailable offence. Now in CRPC, it is provided under section 436. Here, it is mandatory duty on police as well as the court to release the accused on bail. So the court or the police has no discretion in this matter. This means the accused person is entitled for bail as a matter of right here. And if the court deems fit, the accused may be granted bail with or without surety. This is applicable to all persons other than those accused of a non-bailable offence. The second one is the bail in non-bailable offence. It is called as regular bail. Here, when a person is accused or suspected for the commission of any non-bailable offence and then he is arrested and detained without warrant, and then he appears or brought before a court, he may be released on bail. Now, this power to grant bail is provided under two sections, namely Section 437 and Section 439 of CRPC. Section 437 empowers the magistrate or the officer in charge of the police station to deal with questions of bail and grant it. Whereas, Section 439 empowers the High Court or the Court of Sessions to do the same. Next comes the Anticipatory bail. It is dealt by section 438 of the CRPC. It is nothing but a bail granted before an arrest or in the anticipation of arrest. When a person has the reason to believe that he or she may be arrested on an accusation of having committed a non-bailable offence. It is granted by the High Court or the Court of Sessions based on certain factors like the nature of offence etc. Next comes the default bail. It is also called as mandatory bail or statutory bail. It is granted under section 167 class 2. It mandates that if the investigation is not completed within the speculated maximum period of 90 days or 60 days, then the accused is to be released on bail whatever may be the nature of the accusation against him. Other than these, you would also have heard about the interim bail. See, this is generally granted during pendency of regular or anticipatory bail application. It may be granted when the court is satisfied that the object of the accusation is to injure the reputation of the accused person and humiliate him. This bail is consistent with the fundamental right to life and liberty under Article 21 of the Constitution. With these basics, let us briefly see what the issue mentioned in the FAQ article is. It talks about the interim bail granted to the activist Tista Settlewood under section 437 of CRPC. Remember, it deals with regular bail. While considering the bail, the peculiar facts are taken into consideration. Mainly, the activist being a female was taken as a factor to grant interim bail. This is because, as per this section, court may grant bail in certain circumstances. This include if such a person is under the age of 16 or if the person is a woman or if the person is sick or infirm. Other than this, if the court is satisfied that it is just and proper to grant bail for any other special reasons, then the bail is granted. So, it is as per law only the activist's bail was considered. Now, taking this opportunity, we are going to see other women-specific provisions in CRPC. That is, provisions where special consideration are given to women. First is section 160. This section deals with a police officer's power to require attendance of witness. Generally, a witness has to appear before the officer whenever required. 
but in case of woman witness here the officer has to go to the place where she resides to make enquiries second is section 46 this deals with how arrest has to be made generally during arrest the officer can touch or confine the body of the person to be arrested but in case of woman accused the police officer shall not touch the woman for making arrest rather an oral intimation of arrest has to be given to obtain the woman's custody but an exception here is a woman police officer can touch the woman accused further to ensure the safety of woman who is arrested an amendment was brought in place in 2005 After this as per class 4 of the section arrest of the woman after sunset or before sunrise is prohibited here also there is an exception woman police officer can obtain prior permission of the judicial magistrate to arrest a woman after sunset or before sunrise next is section 47 this deals with searching of a place by police officer to get hold of the accused now if the accused is in a premise or apartment having woman then the officer just simply cannot break open the apartment and enter it rather they have to give notice of entering and alert the woman so that they can withdraw from that place so you can understand that these sections ensure the safety of women and make sure that they are not harassed by the police officers now after listening to this discussion inform about these legal rights to the women in your life let them know when and how a woman can be arrested and also they can get bail under section 437 for non bailable offence citing the factor that they are women so that's all regarding this discussion in this discussion we saw what is bail the types of bail and we also saw women specific provisions in crpc with this let us conclude this discussion and take up the next news article take a look at this news article the article talks about the appointment of justice chandrachud as the executive chairperson of nalsa in this context let us see what is nalsa and what are all its functions the syllabus regarding this discussion is highlighted here for your friends you can pause the video and go through it see nalsa refers to national legal services authority now let's see about its constitution It is constituted under the Section Three of Legal Services Authorities Act, 1987. Then, coming to its presiding officers, the Act says that the present Chief Justice of India must be the Patent Chief of Nalsa, while any serving a retired Supreme Court judge is to be nominated by the President as its Executive Chief. Now, let's see the functions of Nalsa. The main function is to monitor the implementation of legal aid programs. and also to lay down policies for making legal services available to all citizens irrespective of their economic status okay the other important function of nalsa include organizing lok adalats here let us see briefly about lok adalats lok adalats mean people's court you all know that indian courts are burdened by lot of backlogs right to solve this problem lok adalats provide for speedier and not so expensive justice through persuasion and conciliation here note that lok adalats have also been given statutory status under the provisions of the legal services authorities act 1987 see these are all the functions of nalsa now coming to the presence of legal services authority in the indian courts legal services authority have been constituted in various courts from the supreme court to the taluk level court which also include high courts and district courts through this wide presence the main motif of article 39a under the dpsp of the indian constitution which provides for free legal aid to the poor and the weaker section is getting fulfilled so that's all regarding this discussion see through this discussion we saw about nalsa and its functions so with this information let us conclude this discussion and take up the next news article look at this faq article This article talks about a military exercise conducted by Russia. The name of the exercise is Vostok 22. India joined the exercise but did not participate in the naval drill. This is about the FAQ article. In this discussion, let us discuss the article in detail. Firstly, let us see about the exercise and which countries are participating in the exercise. See Vostok 22 is an annual military exercise. and it is conducted by russia in its eastern region from september 1 to 
it is said that 13 countries will be participating in the exercise. According to the Russian Ministry of Defense, the countries that have sent military contingents are Algeria, Armenia, Azerbaijan, Belarus, India, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, China, Laos, Mongolia, Nicaragua, Syria and Tajikistan. It is said that more than 50,000 troops and 5,000 units of military equipments including 140 aircrafts and 60 warships would participate in the exercise. Now according to Indian Defence Ministry, India has sent only its army contingent 7-8 Gurkha rifles and it will not take part in the maritime section of the two-part event. If you are asking me why this is because, see the first part of land exercise will be held in Russian military training grounds in Siberia. But the maritime part of the exercise will be held on the Sea of Vostok and Sea of Japan. So here comes the issues. The location is near the disputed Southern Kuril Islands. Even after a warning was sent by the Japan's foreign ministry to move the location of the maritime exercise, Russian ambassador in Tokyo rejected it. So, India's decision to not participate in the naval drills is thought to have been made in consideration of Tokyo's concerns. Here, you must note another thing. The Biden administration is currently working to put together far more sanction against Russia in response to its invasion of Ukraine and it is demanding for price caps on Russian oil exports. So, at this time, the decision by India and other countries to participate in Vostok 2022 presents a divided approach towards Russia. But India said that it has been regularly participating in multilateral exercises in Russia along with other countries. And India insisted that it will be participating only in Vostok exercise this year. So, what does India's participation mean? By sending an army contingent to join Russian and Chinese troops in exercises this year, New Delhi is aiming to send a four-pronged message. The first is its continuing relationship with Russia despite the Ukraine war. See, Indian government has decided not to join the Western sanctions regime or to curb oil imports and other economic engagement with Moscow. So through this and along with participating in the Vostok 2022 exercise, India is showing its support to its all-weather friend that is Russia. Secondly, by participating in the Vostok 2022 exercise, India is trying to signal balance and non-alignment in the current crisis. Thirdly, by staying away from the maritime exercise, New Delhi has shown its sensitivity to Japan's concerns on maintaining the status quo over the disputed islands as well as stressing the importance of territorial sovereignty and integrity for India. Finally, the message the government continues to give is that it is willing to engage with China on the number of fronts even as military talks with China at the line of actual control remain stuck. The government, however, asserts that it cannot be business as usual with China until the latest logjam over Chinese troops' transgression since April 2022 is resolved. So, this is the four-pronged message that India is trying to convey by participating in the Vostok 2022 exercise. See, these points are very important. See, if there is a question in mains asking you to write how India is trying to balance between the West and the East in the current world scenario, you can repurpose all these points in your answers. Okay, so all these points are very relevant for your mains examination. I hope this discussion was useful. With this, let us conclude this and take up the next news article. Look at this news article. This news article talks about a small broken piece of figurine which has been unearthed by archaeologists at Maligai Medu near Gangai Konda Cholapuram. See, this city was built by King Rajendra Chola I after his victorious expedition up to the Gangetic Plains. So, in this news article discussion, let us focus on Gangai Konda Cholapuram and King Rajendra Chola I. First, let us take Gangai Konda Cholapuram. See, the meaning of the words Gangai Konda Cholapuram is one who conquered the Ganges. So, as I already said in the introduction, following the conquest of the Gangetic Plains in 1023 AD, Rajendra I built a great city and the city is called as Gangai Konda Cholapuram. He also built a Shiva temple called Gangai Konda Choleshwarar and a lake called Chola Gangam in commemoration of his victory. He even shifted his capital from Tanjavur to this newly built town. 
From this period to the end of the Chola family rule, in 1279 AD, Gangai Konda Cholapuram remained as the capital of the Chola Empire. The city is celebrated in the literature of Moovarula by Otta Kutanar and Kalingath Parani of Jayam Kondar. Now talking about the Shiva temple Gangai Konda Cholaishwarar, it was built between 1023 AD and 1036 AD. It has a beautiful gallery of Chola art and architecture. Many sculptures brought from Andhra, Karnataka and Bengal as war trophies are also preserved in the temple and nearby villages. At present, it is under the control of Archaeological Survey of India and the Hindu Religious and Charitable Endowment Department of Government of Tamil Nadu. And recently, UNESCO declared the temple as one of the World Heritage Monuments. Now finally, let us take Rajendra Chola one. Rajendra Chola is the son of Raja Raja Chola. He formally ascended the Chola throne in 1014 AD. Even as a king, Rajendra Chola continued his father's policies. It is during the time of Rajendra Chola, the Chola Navy attained its peak. During the reign of Rajendra Chola I, he established colonies in Sri Lanka, Thailand and other Southeast Asian countries. And Tamil Chola armies exacted tribute from Thailand and the Khmer Kingdom of Cambodia regularly. So this is about King Rajendra Chola I. So that's all regarding this discussion. In this discussion, we saw about Gangai Konda Cholapuram and King Rajendra Chola I. With this, let us conclude the news article discussion session and take up the practice prelims questions. We have three practice prelims questions today. Let us see them one by one. Let us take up the first question. See, three statements regarding Gangai Konda Choleshwara temple is given. We have to find the correct statements. Let us take up the first statement. Gangai Konda Choleshwara temple is dedicated to Lord Vishnu. See, this statement is wrong because we saw in our discussion that this temple is dedicated to Lord Shiva. This is a Shiva temple. So, statement 1 is wrong. Let us take up the second statement. Rajaraja 1 shifted his capital from Tanjavur to Gangai Konda Cholapuram. See, this statement is also wrong because in our discussion we saw that it is Rajendra 1 who shifted the Chola capital from Tanjavur to Gangai Konda Cholapuram. So, statement 2 is also wrong. Let us take up the third statement. Recently discovered Isalam copper plates of 1036 AD of Rajendra 1 give concrete evidence that he built the Gangai Konda Choleshwara temple. See, this statement is correct. So, since statement 1 is wrong, statement 2 is wrong and statement 3 is correct, the correct answer here is option B, 3 only. Let us take up the second question. Here, two statements regarding Indian Council of Agricultural Research is given. We have to find the correct statement. Let us take up the first statement. The Indian Council of Agricultural Research is an autonomous organization under the Department of Agricultural Research and Education. See, this statement is correct. The Indian Council of Agricultural Research is an autonomous organization under the Department of Agricultural Research and Education. It comes under the Union Ministry of Agriculture. Let us take up the second statement. Normally, three seasons of independent assessment by the Indian Council of Agricultural Research is required for approving a new fertilizer. See, this statement is also correct. Normally, three seasons of independent assessment by Indian Council of Agricultural Research is required for approving a new fertilizer. So, here both the statements are correct. So, the correct answer here is option C, both 1 and 2. Let us take up the last question. See, here two statements regarding Nalsa is given. You have to find the correct statement. See, this is a quiz question for today. Interested aspirants, post your answers in the comment section. The main questions based on today's discussion is displayed here. Write the answers and post it in the comment section. With this, we have come to the end of the video. If you like today's discussion, like, comment and share it with your friends. For more updates regarding UPSC preparation, subscribe to Shankara Ace Academy YouTube channel. Thank you for listening.